Thursday, December the 23rd, Christmas Eve Eve, Santa's in charge. Stocks are rallying, albeit on light volume. The countdown to the close starts right now. The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. Thirty minutes to go until we break for Christmas here in Europe. Uh, we do have a little bit of trading tomorrow morning, but I think a lot of people have made the decision basically to bail out already. The stock 600 is up by 1% at the moment, 483. We're up by nearly five points here in Europe. Travel and leisure is having a really solid day. The market definitely looking through Omicron. The news around Omicron getting significantly better, it seems, versus the beginning of the week. The pound is also bid. We're repricing the Bank of England. And again, there's an Omicron factor in all of this. And the other story you definitely want to focus on here in Europe is this massive drop that we've seen in gas prices. Gas prices have been rocketing higher, but we're now starting to see some LNG carriers crossing the North Atlantic, bringing some welcome relief. From London, I'm Guy Johnson with my co-host in New York today, Shanali Basak. Alex Steele has a day off today in preparation for the festivities. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Shanali, it's amazing. The beginning of the week, the market's falling out of bed. Everybody was panicking about, A, fiscal spending in the United States, but more importantly, that Omicron was going to be really severe. The numbers were cracking higher. But now we're starting to get some good news. Today feels like a much better news day. It's a better news day, and you don't need to rise too much, right, to get back to that record number for the S&P. And we have hit that again today. But you know what? You and I, Guy, we keep an eye on those risks. And we're going to talk about what can go wrong still. Oh, yeah. We need to talk about what is likely to be a very bumpy ride in 2022. There's so many forces that are coming into play. Let's figure out what's happening in the U.S., though. Get some details. Here's Abigail Doolittle. Well, Guy, let's talk about what's going right, because we ha do have that S&P 500 higher for a third day in a row, up 7 tenths of 1 percent right now. Near session highs up more than 3 percent over the last three days. And to Shanali's point and what you were talking about earlier, the S&P 500 on pace for yet another closing high. This after the sky was feeling, feeling uh, fall, sky was falling feeling earlier this uh, week and last week on Omicron. But what a couple of days make and some hope around uh, some treatments. You can see the Nasdaq 100 also higher. Bonds down, supporting the idea that it's a risk on theme. And you have that 10 year yield right in that sweet spot of not too high, not too low, right around 1.5 percent. In contrast to natural gas futures plunging guy, take a look at gasoline futures up more than one percent. This, of course, has to do with a refinery uh, fire at an Exxon Mobil refinery down in Texas right in time for the holiday. Not sure that's good news, but stocks at record highs. That certainly is, Guy. Absolutely. Um, and we did see a fairly big drop in gas prices today, and I'm talking about natural gas prices on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, so multiple drops on the gas front. Uh, OK, let's turn to our question of the day, which I have to say, say was slightly inspired uh, by our next guest. The question, a fairly straightforward one. Can central banks tame inflation without causing a recession? Will high energy prices cause a recession in 2022? Well, let's get some insight now from Bilal Hafiz, the CEO and editor of Macro Hype. Bilal, one of my highlights every year around this time of year is your grey swans. You look forward into next year, you look at the non-consensus events which could cause us a few headaches. One of those was, are we going to see a recession in 2022? And that certainly got me thinking about the risks that we face going into next year. The Fed could be hiking three, possibly four times. We've got an energy crisis on our hands. Those are two pretty strong ingredients for a recession. Yes, absolutely. And I think that one of the interesting things about people's forecasts for next year, 2022, is that nobody's really forecasting a recession in the US. At the same time, this year, just recently, we've had negative quarters in places like Japan and parts of Europe. And if we look at forecasts for next year for the US, most people are expecting a loss of growth momentum. But if you step back, what you typically find is that whenever the Fed does raise rates and whenever oil prices have doubled, which is what we've seen this year, typically that does lead to a recession. So it's quite surprising that no one's calling for a recession next year when we have lots of the ingredients in place for such a thing to happen. 
You know, I want to push back a little bit here because I think it's Wall Street's job in so many ways to be optimistic. But why is it that nobody is actually believing a recession could happen as soon as next year? I think one reason is that uh, this year growth was fairly strong, so people tend to just uh, forecast by, uh, by using recent growth momentum. Also, the labor market in the U.S. Uh, seems quite strong, and so people are expecting that to continue into, into next year. And then also there's been a general view that the fiscal side of the picture for the U.S. will be quite supportive. But of course, recently we've seen that picture start to turn. Um, and so those are some of the reasons I think that people are fairly optimistic about next year, which I think... Is, is a bit misplaced. Bilal, is the risk higher in Europe? The, the rate risk maybe isn't there in the same ways that it is in the United States. We were talking uh, to Francisco Blanche from Bank of America a little bit earlier on. He said, effectively, Europe's already in an industrial recession. Yes, I think absolutely. Europe in many ways, has more problems than the U.S. does. On, on the energy side, not only has it suffered from higher oil prices, but it has suffered from higher natural gas prices, notwithstanding uh, today's decline in, in nat gas prices. Also, on top of that, if you look at across the Eurozone, of course, Germany's done relatively well, but other parts of Europe are doing less well. And then on top of that, Europe is also a bit more sensitive to Chinese growth. And China has been much weaker over the past uh, 12 months or so. So it doesn't get that support from that side. And then the, the, the final thing to note is that Europe has reacted much more strongly to COVID than, than the US or indeed the UK by introducing restrictions, which again is another factor that could see much slower growth in the Eurozone, possibly even a recession. Now, I'm wondering what really pushes the story over the edge here. Does there need to be an exogenous event like another wave of COVID or a geopolitical tension that pushes us to the edge? Well, I think certainly something like uh, a continued increase in oil prices uh, would certainly help push things over the edge. And what could cause that could be some tensions with Russia in terms of the supply of, of energy uh, in general. Um, the COVID side, I think, is less clear because, at least on the U.S. side, the U.S. isn't really implementing any restrictions around COVID, so the, the economic impact is less, less extreme. However, if China was to slow significantly, then that could have a knock-on effect on the U.S. So if, if China does respond more strongly to COVID, then that could be that knock-on effect. So, so I would say oil, higher oil, could be, could be a factor. And then the other side, I think, could be uh, the fiscal story in the U.S., uh, or those effects waning could suddenly reveal that the U.S. underlying demand may not be as strong as people anticipated. Bilal, we talk about today being a good news day. There is a piece of data that's just hit the Bloomberg terminal, which maybe stands against that. The U.K. reporting 119, nearly 120,000 more COVID cases on December the 23rd. That's a pickup from just over 100,000 yesterday. The numbers are blistering in terms of the rate of change that we're seeing here in the UK. What kind of arc do you think we're on, though, when it comes to Omicron and how quickly we could get through it? Well, all, all the estimates and our forecasts suggest that we could see a peak in COVID cases in January in, in the UK. The, the big challenge and thing we're all trying to contend with is how serious and how virulent is this? Will this lead to much more hospitalizations? Will the hospitalizations be long stay? Will people need to stay for a week or so? Or will it just be one or two days? And of course, most worryingly, will it lead to higher death rates? And so far, the news on all of those fronts is fairly positive. So at this stage, it doesn't look like we could have a you know, the prospect of a collapse in the health system. Uh, that said, you know, one thing that's hard to forecast is the isolation effect. So if people do uh, have COVID, then they have to isolate. So if many health workers have to isolate, then that will put a massive strain on the health system in January, which could then lead to additional restrictions. So that's probably the wild card. But at this stage, I think that the new, you know, the, the, the overall view is, is, is probably more on the optimistic side than the pessimistic side. You know, there's another risk that I really enjoy that you've brought up, and it's that the real rates Armageddon is coming with higher inflation and lower growth. How are investors left unprotected? Absolutely. You know, especially longer term investors like pension funds, insurance companies, implicitly, they uh, need real rates to be positive and high in order for them to deliver the returns that are expected for pensioners. The problem now is real rates are very negative and they're likely to remain low for a long, long time. And so suddenly that leads to this problem where can pension funds fill the gap that's left by negative real rates? Uh, you know, does that mean that they start to increase their risk? 
by piling into private equity and other types of markets like that? Or does it mean that they need to suddenly ask uh, workers to increase their pension contributions? And already in places like the UK, you're starting to see where there are demands for people to put more money into their pensions, people are going on strike. So in the university sector, uh, many uh, academics are starting to go on strike. So this could be a big source of tension over the course of the next 12 months if people are forced to have to make more pension contributions because real rates are so low. Bilal, great stuff as ever. Thank you very much indeed. Always interesting. Bilal Hafiz, Macro High founder and CEO. That was just a taste because Bilal is going to join me on Bloomberg Radio a little bit later on for around 30 minutes. We'll work our way in to some of those grey swans on the cable. That's going to happen uh, here in London at 5pm on DAB Digital Radio. Uh, you'll also be able to catch us, of course, on your Bloomberg terminal. Uh, and we now have the podcasts on Spotify and Apple, Shanali. Yep, coming up next, though, before we get there, is why household energy prices are likely to stay hot for a while. We'll talk to Shemin Sower Power, Bank of Eng Ireland's head of inflation trading. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First One News. I'm Rishka Gupta. Merck's COVID-19 pill has been cleared by U.S. regulators, giving high-risk patients another at-home treatment option. The drug received emergency authorization on the heels of Pfizer's competing pill that was cleared yesterday. Together, the treatments promise to provide a new way to keep a sharp rise on infections from overwhelming U.S. hospitals. The European Union is urging negotiators to speed up their efforts to resolve a standoff between Iran and the U.S. when they meet on December 27th for the next round of talks aimed at reviving the 2015 nuclear deal. The EU's chief negotiator tweeted today that it's important to, quote, pick up the pace on key outstanding issues. The U.S. exited the pact in 2018 and reimposed sanctions on Iran, which in response started to significantly expand its nuclear program. German health officials say they expect a surge in coronavirus cases around New Year's and the country is warning people will likely need a fourth vaccine shot to maintain the best immune response against COVID-19. The government is urging Germans to limit their contacts over the holiday period. About 70% of the population are fully vaccinated, 35% have had boosters. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta, this is Bloomberg Shanali. Yeah, thank you so much, Ritika. We're getting back to our core question here and that's whether central banks can tame inflation without causing a recession. We have the perfect person to talk about this after growing up in Istanbul and now Bank of Ireland's global markets head of inflation trading. She's obsessed with inflation. Shemin Seller Power is here to join us. Do you have faith in central banks when it comes to being able to curb inflation without taking us off this trajectory? Hi, uh, Shnali. Thanks for having me. Um, yes, um, we still believe that uh, market um, expectations for next year in terms of risky asset pricing and growth outlook is very positive because uh, they are feeling uh, pretty comfortable that growth will be um, about trend still and there are enough savings to support uh, consumers. Uh, at the same time, there are uh, some downside risks as well. Um, Looking at uh, the news we got uh, with Joe mentioned not supporting Build Back uh, Better plan um, and with some previous fiscal support measures about to expire next year uh, as well, we are actually expecting contribution from fiscal policy side to US growth to be negative next year. And um, also now central banks are uh, changing their reaction functions and um, actually prioritizing uh, upside inflation risks over uh, possible downside growth risks also which might uh, come from um, Omicron waves. So um, what we got was a super hawkish uh, pivot from Fed. Um, so not only are they um, stopping um, new QE purchases in March, they also told us they are looking to deliver three rate hikes next year and they have already discussed quantitative yep. tightening, uh, tightening. And what we heard from Governor uh, Waller last Friday was that they are looking to deliver that uh, after one or two rate hikes. So 
Um, that can also happen uh, in 2022. So that will be a lot for the market to digest. OK, so it looks like we're going to have a really bumpy year. Just in terms of where you expect inflation to go next year, market pricing looks really relaxed at the moment. Market pricing basically is signalling that we're going to go back to around 2% on the, uh, the, uh, in terms of US inflation. Do you believe market pricing at the moment? Um, well, even Fed dropped the word uh, transitory. So... Um, uh, the market uh, and central banks are aware that inflationary pressures are much more broad-based right now rather than just being focused on energy prices or reopening um, related components. Um, so uh, we ourselves actually see near term some upside risks. Uh, we believe it's very likely that uh, U.S. inflation will move uh, above 7 percent in the first quarter. And there are also upside risks for uh, European inflation looking at what has been uh, happening in the natural gas market. Um, the market was already very tight with low inventories, and when we saw a number of French uh, nuclear reactors taken off the grid and the Russian supply was lower than expected, we've seen a price spike. So there are also near-term upside risks for inflation in Europe. Um, but uh, looking uh, out into more uh, medium term, um, yes, we are expecting some supply chain-related pressures to ease in the second half of the year. Uh, delivery times are already shortening. And the energy base effects mean that the contribution on headline uh, from energy side will be lower. And keep in mind, currently, when we are looking at the base effects, we are comparing 2021 prints versus 2020 prints. And in uh, 2020, we even had a short period where uh, the WTI prices were actually negative. So looking at where they are now, about $70 per barrel, that base effect this year was super strong. But looking into next year, in 2022, we are actually going to be comparing uh, 22 prices with uh, 21 prices. So the starting point will be much higher and the base effects will be actually um, not as uh, punitive for the headline inflation. At the same time, we do not expect to uh, move back to pre-pandemic low inflation uh, levels either. Uh, obviously, still very strong housing components, rent, OER, that's going to continue. There is massive pent-up demand for services, especially travel. Uh, that is going to continue. And wages are picking up. And yep. um, I was surprised looking at Fed's uh, December projections that they're already seeing unemployment levels next year below NARO, so below the equilibrium level. And uh, we know that there are some issues with um, some people still not returning to the labor market due to healthcare concerns, due to childcare availability, well, some people tired. So um, if those um, issues become more structural, we could see even higher uh, wage pressures impacting inflation. You know, I'm wondering also, there is a non-zero chance of stagflation in the minds of many analysts and investors now. How do you view the risk? Um, yeah, um, especially looking at uh, what the market was pricing in in uh, Europe uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, um, uh, so um, after global financial uh, crisis, obviously, um, we weren't seeing coordinated fiscal and monetary policy. Um, instead, we were seeing austerity measures and central banks were the only game in town. So when we were looking at the distribution of inflation risk, the uh, market was more focused on um, inflation uh, surprising on the downside. But looking at what has been happening um, after the pandemic and looking at um, how fast fiscal policy measures have kicked in, obviously that distribution has uh, changed. And now market is very much focused on the um, upside risks on inflation side. Yep. So um, at the same time, yeah, there is uh, more uncertainty on the growth side. As we will see now, public policy step out and the private sector uh, will need yep. to uh, continue without the public support. Sharon, we're going to leave it there. Have a very Merry Christmas. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next year. It's going to be a big year for inflation. Sharon Sona Power, Bank of Ireland, Global Markets Head of Inflation Trading. Thank you very much indeed. This is Bloomberg.
Mm -hmm. uh, I'll take it for just today. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash to look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Rishka Gupta. ExxonMobil says a fire at its Baytown facility in Texas, the fourth largest refinery in the United States, has been extinguished. Officials say four people have been injured. The fire broke out about 1 a.m. local time. ExxonMobil says air quality monitoring at the site and fence line has shown no adverse impact so far. Shares of Crocs fell by the most in a year after the footwear company announced a new deal. The company has agreed to buy casual shoe brand Hey Dude for $2.5 billion. Crocs says it expects a deal to immediately add to its sales growth and earnings and generate, quote, significant free cash flow. Hey Dude, which will operate as a standalone division, makes lightweight casual shoes and sandals for men, women and children. And airlines face an uncertain few weeks as the spread of the Omicron coronavirus appends what's traditionally one of the busiest periods of the year for flight sales. Although airline stocks rallied early today following reports that Omicron is likely not as severe as previous variants, countries across Europe are bringing back travel restrictions and even lockdowns. And that is your latest business flash, Shanali Guy. Yeah, thank you so much, Rithika. Guy, are you willing to get back on a plane again? Yeah, pretty much. I have to say that you would want to be masked up. You want to take precautions. You want to be protected. Good masks, probably a, a fairly good idea at this point. Um, but yeah, aeroplanes have medical grades uh, air filtration on them. Um, so in some ways, they're, they're, they're quite safe places to be relative to other inside gatherings. But yeah, I would certainly want to be making sure that I was careful if I was getting on a plane. I know a lot of people are. They're going to be heading down to Florida. Here in Europe, actually, travel probably much more restricted. So it's going to be interesting to see kind of the two different models on either side of the Atlantic and how they, how they kind of develop after Christmas. But the, the numbers here in the UK at the moment are absolutely eye-watering. 120,000 cases. That's, that's a big, big number. That's a pandemic high in terms of the numbers. So the advice certainly seems to be from the authorities, don't travel if you don't have to. But yeah, and businesses Christmas. are certainly asking their staff to stay put as much as possible to keep businesses normal. Yeah. Um, I think it's... it's the, the trajectory we're on is really fascinating. So you look at some of the headlines uh, out of the UK today, and we, we started the show talking about the positive news. It's a storm, not a hurricane. But the numbers are really high. Less people are ending up in hospital. But the number, I, the, the, kind of the, the curve is much higher and the, the amplitude is just that much bigger. So it's going to be, are we going to come back down as hard? That's the bit that I don't know. Yeah, some good news what, baked what? in there, right? I mean, even with higher cases, less yeah. deaths. So let's get through this next phase of this pandemic. Yeah, and, and hopefully more testing over in the United States will help out yes, as well. Emma absolutely. Hodcroft uh, is going to join us. Uh, she is going to join us from the University of Bern. She's a molecular epidemiologist. We'll get her take on this. What do we know? We're all kind of pseudo-epidemiologists. She's actually a real epidemiologist. We'll talk to her later. Uh, the close is next. This is Bloomberg.
So, in the words of Elon Musk, uh, we're nearly there. Not quite, nearly there. European equity markets, though, having a fairly solid session. Uh, we are up. We're not quite at record highs. The S&P, I know, is tracking towards that uh, if we finish where we are right now. But nevertheless, a really positive session considering where we started the week. FTSE's up by around half of 1%. The DAX up around 8 tenths of 1%. The DAX outperforming uh, up a full 1% on the session. Let's show you the session, how it's developed, what we've seen. It is light volume. I appreciate that. Uh, so the signal here, probably a little bit low. But we've been kind of right to left, uh, sorry, left to right uh, throughout the day. Starting off here, a little bit of a gap, uh, and then moving throughout the day, ever higher. So finishing up, nice round number, up 1% on the, uh, the stock 600, 483. Remember, we've been kind of in the 490s, so we're not quite there yet in terms of records. Let's show you what the sector breakdown story looks like. Uh, this is the picture here. As you can see, every single sector is in positive territory. Where are we seeing the real gains coming through? Well, in terms of weight, certainly the banks are doing so a lot of the heavy lifting today. Uh, we're up by around 1.72% uh, on the banking sector. But we're also seeing some good news coming through from the travel and leisure sector, which has been a real outperform this week uh, and it's a real mix it's travel doing well it's also leisure doing well or leisure doing well as I should probably say uh, so uh, we're up by 1.61 percent there it is a more defensive mix down at the bottom end of the market so this is a risk on session uh, food and beverage down there at the bottom the healthcare sectors down there at the bottom uh, the utilities down there real estate the more defensive end of the market underperforming on the session. Quick look at where we go in terms of the individual stocks. Uh, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, FAS, reporting earlier that Lufthansa uh, is going to be significantly reducing its winter schedule. But the expectation is that we get through Omicron relatively quickly. We have the tools to do that. Yes, the numbers are very high at the moment. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, but they will fade, and as a result of which, actually, the summer season could look quite good. Uh, the travel and leisure sector has been badly beaten up, particularly the travel end of it, badly beaten up. Lufthansa, as you can see, up by 1.6%. But IAG's had a good day today. Wiz has had a good day today. Uh, Ryanair uh, has had a good day today. Despite the fact they're seeing near-term pressure... The expectation is that the summer looks good. Uh, we've also got Flutter Entertainment uh, doing fairly well today, also in the travel and leisure sector, so it's the leisure end of the market. Uh, Flutter up by 2.39%. Uh, it's buying one of its rivals in Italy. This is a company called Cecil uh, that it's buying. I think it's around 1.6 billion, the price tag. The interesting thing here is that they're buying that business from CVC the private equity business, another private equity exit, which is interesting. So flutter up on the back of that. Uh, and then AstraZeneca. Actually, in share price terms, not really moving very much today. Uh, as we've already mentioned, some of the drug stocks, some of the more defensive stocks not doing that well today. But Astra basically flatlining. But really good news uh, surrounding the, Oster, uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine uh, in terms of the third dose uh, and the impact that that booster can have. Really quite good results coming through. Uh, just part of the smorgasbord, smorgasbord of good news we've seen today, uh, Shanali, uh, around dealing with this vaccine. Uh, we've got good news on the therapeutics. We've got good news on the vaccine front as well. Uh, and that's really helping this market sentiment story out. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to stick with the virus because we want to make some sense of the data for you. The UK is reporting just under 120,000 new COVID cases and 147 new deaths. Italy is now reporting a new record daily case load of over 44,000. Emma Hodcroft, the University of Bern molecular epidemiologist, joins us now. Emma, these are numbers. What do they mean to you? To me, this is another example of just how fast Omicron is spreading. We have known from other countries like South Africa that this could move quickly, but I think we're really seeing that exemplified in the recent numbers from the UK and Italy. And it's a reminder that the real threat here is to the hospitalization and to our healthcare systems. With case numbers like this before the vaccine, we would be in big trouble. The good news is with the vaccine, even against Omicron, we have some protection against those severe outcomes. But if a lot of people get this at the same time, even if only a small number of those need hospitalization, we risk overwhelming our healthcare systems. How big a threat is that? Um, the British papers are taking a much more positive view today uh, in terms of their perception. Uh, the Times of London, it's a storm, not a hurricane, uh, say scientists. Would you agree with that? So I think some of this comes from recent reports that suggest that Omicron may be less severe than Delta. But there's a couple of really important factors here why we don't want to celebrate too early. First, some of this is probably coming from vaccine protection. And so that means that even people that are vaccinated, they might be getting infected now with Omicron, but they're not ending up needing as much hospital care or perhaps to go to hospital at all. Unfortunately, for unvaccinated people, 
they could still be at serious risk. So we need to remember that this may not be milder in them. And then the last thing is that, as I said, even if it's milder, even if fewer people need to go to hospital as a percentage, if hundreds of thousands of people get this at the same time, and a lot of healthcare workers are out right now because they have Omicron, we could come to a point where we simply can't give everyone the care that they need. And of course, that's even before we consider normal emergency care and routine procedures that are having to be delayed once again. So I think at this point, it's really about flattening that curve so that we don't end up with more people needing care than we can care for. With the direction of travel here, what does this mean for January when more people start to return to their offices? I do think this is something that it's really important governments keep in mind. At the moment, many places, especially in Europe, have introduced more restrictions. But Christmas itself and the holiday period is a bit of a strange time. Yes, we meet up with family and maybe a few friends, but a lot of people will be careful. They might spread things to some relatives, but it might also be contained in that family circle. Now, things will change in January if people start going back to work. Some countries still have work from home, others won't. But it's important to remember that it's those more normal routines, those interactions in the workplace, meetings up after work, those are potentially the bigger problem for transmission. So countries need to remember, even if we see a delay or a, a, a plateau in cases over Christmas, thanks to restrictions, we need to be really careful that as people go back to the office and back to their normal routines, we could see an uptick in cases again. Emma, do we know how many of the people that are currently in hospital have Omicron and how many have Delta? And I'm wondering if once we get through Omicron, Delta almost comes back. The, the curves look very different. The Omicron curve looks very steep and potentially could come down quite quickly. Delta obviously has been something that's been around for a lot longer. The curve looks flatter, but potentially more dangerous. Does Delta come back once Omicron has passed? So this is an interesting question. Uh, it, we don't yet know whether if you have Omicron, what kind of protection that might leave you with uh, against Delta, for example. But certainly we know that the vaccines protect you against hospitalization for both. Now, one thing I think is really important to keep in mind here is what the German health minister said last year. And he said quite bluntly that after this winter, people will either be vaccinated, recovered or dead. Now, that was before Omicron, but I think Omicron is making this point even a little bit more starkly because it transmits so quickly that if you aren't vaccinated, there's a very good chance you'll get it. Hopefully you will recover and not need any, not have any severe outcomes, not need hospitalization. But it will mean, I think, that when we come out the other end of this, we will have a higher level of population level immunity. Of course, I highly recommend you get that through a vaccine, but for those who haven't, they might well get it through infection this winter. Now, I don't think that's the best way we could get to this level, but it could leave us better prepared for other variants and even Delta in the future. Well, that's what I was going to ask. We only really have 30 seconds or so left here, Emma. How worried are you about the future variants, given how quickly Omicron is spreading? I think we have to remain prepared that we don't know what other tricks SARS-CoV-2 could have with its sleeve. Viruses will always continue to mutate. Hopefully, this was the last big set that Omicron could come up with but we don't know that there might not be another one. So it's really important we prepare for a future where we're ready if there's another variant in the future. We can get boosters and vaccines out there quickly and make sure our healthcare systems won't be overwhelmed. Emma, we've really appreciated your input this year and your insight. Thank you very much indeed for bringing it to us. We'll look forward to catching up in the new year. In the meantime, have a very happy Christmas. Emma Hodcroft, University of Bern, molecular epidemiologist. Thank you very much. Indeed. OK, European stocks are done. These are the final numbers. Positive session here in Europe. Delivered on light volume, but nevertheless, what a difference a few days makes. Monday, really brutal. Today, much more positive. Shanali. Yeah, absolutely. We have coming up next, we're going to talk about Putin, who is praising the U.S.'s response to security as a positive one. We'll speak to Aksana Antonenko, Control Risk Group Director of Global Risk. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishki Gupta. You're looking at a live shot in the principal room. Coming up, Laura Rain, the FS Investments Chief US Economist, is at 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Rishka Gupta. The Supreme Court says it will hold a special session in just over two weeks to weigh challenges to two Biden administration policies covering vaccine requirements for millions of workers. The High Court's announcement that it will hear arguments in the cases January the 7th comes amid rising coronavirus cases and is an extraordinarily fast timeline. The court had not been scheduled to hear cases again until January the 10th. Former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers is warning of a testing period for the U.S. economy in coming years with the risk of recession followed by stagnation. In an interview with the Bloomberg Economics Stephanomics podcast, Summers says that the Fed had been late to spot the dangers of inflation and that delayed action to cool prices could potentially tip the economy into a slump. And during his annual press conference in Moscow today, Russian President Vladimir Putin expressed his concerns about inflation. We have 8%, a lot. Our target is 4, so it's double. And the states have it as a factor of 3, so the Federal Reserve, I think, will have to do something. Putin is also urging the West to move quickly to meet Russia's demand for security guarantees to defuse a standoff over Ukraine. He warns that Moscow expects next month's talks with the U.S. in Geneva to produce quick results. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rizka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Shanali Guy. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Rithika. We're going to talk a little bit about what Vladimir Putin had to say during his annual address. Take a listen in. It's not us threatening them. We didn't come to the border of the United States or the United Kingdom. No, they came to our house, to our border. And now they're saying, ah, we want Ukraine to be part of us as well. And you want guarantees from us? No, you are owing us guarantees now, without any delay. Not in decades. In addition to the press conference, we also had headlines crossing the Bloomberg moments ago. A senior U.S. official telling Bloomberg that the U.S. is saying Russia must de-escalate to make progress in Ukraine talks. And they are prepared to meet with Russia in early January, though no date is yet set. Joining us now is Oksana Antonenko, Control Risk Group's Director of Global Risk. With both of these things put together, I'm wondering what you see as the direction of these conversations. Well, Shanali, uh, usually those kind of press conferences from uh, President Putin do not uh, these days generate many headlines. It is mostly for domestic audience. But this year, of course, is very different because we are in the midst of uh, perhaps the most uh, significant uh, security, uh, tense security situation in Europe at the moment. Uh, and uh, in this context, of course, everyone is listening very carefully what President Putin had to say uh, about his intentions and his plans vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine and, of course, generally in the European security. And I think we can detect from his language today that he actually tried a little bit to de-escalate his rhetoric. Uh, definitely compared with what we heard from him just a couple of days ago at a meeting at the Ministry of Defense, where Russia has been threatening a military response uh, if the West and NATO and United States do not provide Russia with guarantees that Ukraine is not going to join NATO. Of course, from the U.S. perspective and the Western perspective, uh, it is not the West, but it is Russia which is generating the current security threat by uh, amassing more than 100 or some estimates have been put it as high as 170,000 troops at the border with Ukraine. Uh, of course, President Putin also mentioned in this clip that you just played uh, that uh, the U.S. administration wants to Ukraine to join NATO, uh, while, of course, you know, in fact, you know, President Biden has been rather careful in what he was saying about Ukraine's membership, you know, during the last NATO summit, he said that the jury yep. is still out and, and, and we will, it will take a long time for Ukraine to join NATO. So there is no urgency here. So uh, Russia is really escalating the situation in order to secure these negotiations uh, with the United States. And it is a positive development, of course, that the Biden administration is responding, that they are ready to sit down with Russia in early January to discuss those security guarantees, although it is unlikely that we're going to see any breakthrough. Oksana, can those talks happen with 100,000 troops on the border? 
Well, I think, you know, it is clear that uh, the West will do everything they can, and both the United States and, of course, the Europeans as well, Germany and France, they want these talks to happen. They believe that, you know, just talking will already uh, help to reduce those tensions that at the moment are really at a very critical level. But the reality is that we have not seen any uh, movement on the ground. The troops are still there. The preparations are still um, taking place, and various, you know, security analysts are estimating that Russia Russia perhaps will be ready for its military operation as soon as the end of January. Therefore, the situation remains very critical. So I think from the Biden administration, they will be watching carefully the fact that Putin did not threaten uh, any further escalation in his press conference and he signaled readiness to sit down and talk. So I think the talks will go ahead. But as I mentioned before, it is very difficult to see any breakthroughs because the positions are very diametrically opposed. Russia wants explicit, mm -hmm. legally binding guarantees that Ukraine will not join NATO, while NATO is saying very clearly that no such guarantees will be forthcoming. Oksana, I'm wondering what the risk of an escalation is at this point. Well, we still uh, assess that the risk of uh, full-scale Russian military offensive uh, in Ukraine remains low. However, of course, we know in the past that uh, this kind of escalatory dynamics can really take the the logic of its own. And we, we see a lot of troops on the border. And of course, there's a lot of concerns that any provocation, any incidents, and we see those incidents happening almost on a daily basis. There are violations of ceasefire happening in eastern Ukraine. There's a lot of military activity in the Black Sea region at the moment. So any uh, accident or incident can really spark this escalation incidentally. But I do not think that we are likely yep. to see deliberate attack from Russia. Oksana, we may not see a deliberate attack, but I thought that Ian Bremer from Eurasia made an interesting point when he was talking to Bloomberg a little bit earlier on. He said they don't have to attack. All they've got to do is annex the Donbass region and that gives them the, the buffer that they're potentially looking for. You don't even need to put boots on the ground to make that happen. Would that be one option, do you think, that Vladimir Putin might decide that he wants to pursue because it doesn't pose the risk of exposing his troops to some sort of conflict and the sanctions that could follow from that? Well, first of all, it is important to say that Russia does have boots on the ground in eastern Ukraine, although, of course, Russia denies having those troops there. But uh, all the OEC observers and, and, and NATO and other experts, you know, continue to insist that Russia does have troops on the ground. And I think the real strategy for Putin at the moment is not to annex uh, Donbass, but actually to force the Ukrainians to... Uh, secure a deal with those separatist regions in order to give those regions a veto over Ukraine's you know, future foreign policy. And that is what Putin wants, because if Putin annexes Donbass, then Ukraine will be free uh, to pursue its foreign policy, potentially even you know, closer security cooperation. But as long as Donbass is, is there and able to influence the situation within Ukraine and destabilize the situation within Ukraine, this is yeah. what counts. Therefore, it's unlikely he'll annex uh, Donbass separately Oksana, from I'm the really, I'm really curious about your thoughts on the strategic positioning here for President Biden, especially given the broader, broader strategic alliance here that Russia and China have. Yes, absolutely. I think it is very important that this press conference that President Putin specifically mentioned, not only that Russia has very close relationship with China in sort of strategic and economic sphere, but also in the military sphere. And I think he knows very well that this is a leverage he can apply vis-a-vis -vis the Biden administration, which is seeking to refocus its attention away from Europe, but more to Asia. And while in Europe, of course, the Biden administration sees Russia's action vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine as a threat, yeah. In Asia, they want to cooperate with Russia to contain China's rise, and, and, and they would want to make sure that there is a constructive dialogue with Russia on China and that Russia doesn't supply military technology to China, which Russia is doing at the moment. Final quick question from me. Europe is experiencing a gas crisis, an energy crisis right now, Oksana. How do you think Vladimir Putin is going to play it over the next couple of months? Well, I think it's interesting that the gas crisis has been discussed a lot today at the press conference. Uh, and what President Putin was saying, uh, that Russia has nothing to do with the current gas prices uh, in Europe, um, doesn't really hold very much water, because I think most of the experts agree that Russia is applying very deliberate strategy of pressuring Europe uh, to certify Nord Stream 2 pipeline as soon as possible, and therefore it is reducing the supply of gas via Ukraine, uh, where it could have supplied substantially 
higher volumes. It's also reducing the level at which it is pumping gas into Gazprom's own storage facilities within Europe, and therefore, you know, keeping all this pressure uh, on the European gas market that potentially we will see shortage later on this winter. So Russia is playing this game, but I think it is going to be counterproductive because Russia has now really um, uh, secured a lot of, you know, attention to this issue of manipulating, you know, gas prices, manipulating its gas supplies for geopolitical ends, and therefore it is likely that Nord Stream 2 certification actually is going to be delayed. So we now hear from a German regulator that it's unlikely to be certified before summer, and therefore it is well likely to continue to see a lot of turbulence this winter, particularly if this winter is cold, and yeah. Russia will continue to play its gas card. Oksana, have a very Merry Christmas. Thank you very much indeed for your time and analysis today. We greatly appreciate it. Oksana Antonenko, Control Risk Group Director for Global Risk. Thank you very much indeed. This is Bloomberg. Counting down to Christmas, the Santa rally is on. Some Omicron optimism certainly helping. Abigail Doolittle here with some details. Well, Guy, we right now are heading to a new all-time closing high for the S&P 500, up about 3%. Your session highs up three days in a row. One of the two three-day winning streaks in December because it's been risk on, risk off. Right now, risk on on that optimism. And a piece of it, of course, banks rising, being helped out by rising yields. Rising yields means haven bonds are down, again confirming this risk appetite that investors have. Rounding it out, chips. We have tech higher, but we really have that socks higher at more than 1%. Big gainers in NVIDIA, applied materials. We also have Tesla up 4.4%. So some of the momentum stocks, they are turning momentum once again today in a risk on weight guy. Abigail, thank you very much indeed. That just about wraps things up for us on Bloomberg Television. Uh, from Shanali and myself, thank you for watching today. Shanali, really appreciate you uh, joining me here today. Alex out. Coming up, Laura Rame will be joining BOP and David Weston.